All right. So uh, artificial intelligence is a very heavy topic. And today, what we're going to be discussing are more so the, the finer points. I'm, I've, I'm confident that I've broken it down to small enough scale that everyone should be able to grasp at least the, uh, the most basic level of artificial intelligence, how it works, and what you provide that helps form these artificial intelligences that are all over the place these days. <laughs> Um, and then I'm also going to, uh, to be discussing the controversies that come with that. So first topic we're going to be discussing is the difference between true artificial intelligence, which is what I believe everyone uh, in the discussion of artificial intelligence is afraid of. Uh, and that's probably not so uh, helped by, you know, Hollywood's movies and, and such like that, where you see things like the Terminator. <laughs> and how artificial intelligence helped that version of the world in history um, versus what we are currently facing, which is less artificial intelligence as it's depicted in media and more machine learning and algorithms and how those are utilized. Uh, in order to help describe that, we're going to be going over cognitive wiring, which is uh, very similar to neural path uh, pathways in the human brain and how those are formed. Uh, I'm going to be telling you how those cognitive wirings are utilized by both builder and teacher bots in order to help form these generations of artificial intelligence that we interact with. And then again, you're part of that in the, uh, the creative controversy. So <clears throat> let's start right off the bat with true artificial intelligence uh, would be something that mimics human intelligence in that it has the ability to make decisions. It has the ability to analyze data and then use that decision making and the data analysis to improve its performance and efficiency automatically. It doesn't need an extra step uh, in machine learning's case, an extra two steps in order to improve itself and then come back and make itself better and stronger. Machine learning, on the other hand, is more so a deeply constructed algorithm. And by that, I mean you already interact with algorithms on a daily basis uh, before we've discussed social media and the, the pitfalls that a lot of people fall into where the algorithm decides that controversy and arguments are better to keep you on the platform and keep you discussing with other people than something you would otherwise enjoy, which is a bit of a shame, and that, like we discussed before, that's how it leads to very toxic behavior, especially in adolescents who have no idea what they're getting themselves into. They just know that that's where everyone is. Um, machine learning are more so trained on data sets, and we're gonna discuss a little later how those data sets are controversial for creatives especially, uh, and what they don't like about that point. But we're also going to be discussing uh, the useful data sets and how they're being used for things like automatic driving in cars. Uh, <clears throat> top models uh, for each of these uh, machine learning bots are then taken and they are used to create new generations of the bots with minor tweaks and that's usually how the generational pitch goes. Uh, and machine learning algorithm bots are more so uh, built for specific task performances. Stuff like ChatGPT uh, and how it can be asked like a little earlier to create a two sentence, uh, would you call that a poem? <laughs> on, on Flag Day. Uh, or creating an image using multiple pieces of artwork as an influence in order to create something quote unquote new. Um, things of that nature. And uh, aside from that, machine learning is a very common subset of AI. It's not technically true AI in that it doesn't influence itself. It's just an algorithm that's been trained and then it produces a result rather than improving itself and working towards something stronger. So the way this is accomplished is through cognitive wiring. And I created these little graphics here and there uh, in order to try and explain what cognitive wiring might look like on a programmer's end 
uh, if scripted out in order to try and piece together the whole as best you can. Uh, the part of the problem with cognitive wiring is it's impossible to grasp the whole more so than it is to grasp the simple. Uh, if we use the simple cognitive wiring to take a look at that, and if you look at that triangle or the uh, diamond there, that diamond might represent, say, is this a hot dog or is this a dog? And then it goes one path or the other, and that's how it moves forward down that, you know, down that algorithm to then try and get to the result where then it tells you whether it's a hot dog or a dog. I use that as an example because there is a very old app on both iOS and Android called Is This a Hot Dog? You take a picture of something and it tells you whether a hot dog is there in the photo or not. Um, <clears throat> so these are basically more so just programming instructions for the computers to perform these kind of tasks. Um, like I said earlier, our brains are built in a very similar way from a very young age. You know, you are handed something like a stuffed animal and you form the smell, the touch, um, the taste in, <laughs> in some cases, um, as well as you know, how it's dense and all that. And you form those memories to help define what is a stuffed animal in your own mind. And that might be different in, uh, to certain degrees in your mind than other people. Like some people might, uh, especially older generations uh, such as yourselves, might see a stuffed animal as something as a, a little more rough than something, uh, someone from my generation, which, you know, soft, cushiony, you know, pillowy, more plush uh, stuffed animals would be what we call stuffed animals rather than dolls, which is an interesting distinction, I'm sure, but. <laughs> <clears throat> but again, these, these algorithms are trained in a way through repeated testing, uh, repeated testing and generations and generations of these uh, instructions being built and tweaked. Uh, and this is accomplished through both a builder bot and a teacher, uh, teacher bot. Now, programmers can't build an artificial intelligence themselves. To explain how the human mind forms these uh, definitions of how these objects are and what they are, uh, or in writing process, what forms a full paragraph, what is a pronoun, what is a noun, those definitions are a little more difficult to script out in a way that a computer would be able to take that and form what actually would be able to determine these things. So instead, what programmers do is they build a builder bot. And what the builder bot does is it builds just a simple, robot with a simple distinction and a simple definition and then it allows that robot <clears throat> through testing to determine okay so let's use the hot dog and dog analogy it feeds it let's say 10 photos of a hot dog 10 photos of a dog and then maybe another 10 photos of both being in the same photo right and it's going to ask okay is the is a hot dog here is a dog here or are both here and then through answering those questions, uh, the bot provides its answers and it gives a certain percentage of correct answers or incorrect answers. And that's where the teacher bot comes in. The teacher bot doesn't actually do any sort of teaching. It doesn't tell it the definition of these things or what they are. Instead, what the teacher bot has is an answer sheet in a simple test with simple dots for the bot to fill in and then once the bot fills it in, it grades it on a, uh, on a percentage scale, and that percentage scale is used to determine what bots answered the most correct. And the way the cycle goes is you take the top, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm simplifying this very much, and a lot of these companies have different methods in order how to construct these things. This just so happens to be the most public and available version of how this operates, but <clears throat> it takes maybe the 5% top scoring robots. It then feeds those back to BuilderBot. BuilderBot will take those uh, generations, create clones of those robots, and then it will provide minor tweaks here and there, and then they retest it, and that keeps going. 
And on the most basic scale that you might be able to understand, let's say there's 20 robots in a classroom, four of them get to survive. <laughs> And then four of them propagate into five more robots. And those five robots have different tweaks to them. And then they retest it. And then another four from that testing group get to live and go forward to build, you know, the next generation. And that repeats. You know, every minute these robots provide their answers. They're killed. They're recreated. And it just goes like that for hours and hours and hours. These things are tested, destroyed recreated, tweaked. Um, and that's the cycle between BuilderBot and TeacherBot, and that's how the generations of these robots, these artificial intelligence, are trained. Um, but they need to be provided answers, the TeacherBots. And these answers are provided through you, more or less. There are a couple exceptions to that and how it operates, but we provide the data sets that are used to train these robots. They have to come from somewhere. And the easiest, most efficient way for these companies or these individuals to provide these data sets and script them out is to actually just outsource it to the consumer. You know, you make your purchases on Amazon. Let's, uh, let's use it as an, uh, as an example. If you notice, uh, let's say you don't shop at Amazon very often. Let's say you bought a movie last month, a couple weeks ago you bought a replacement broom, and then last week you bought a toilet seat. And you go back to Amazon again. What Amazon does is it takes that information that it has from your purchase history, as well as your search history, and it uses that as a data set to compare against other consumers on Amazon who have purchased similar things to what you've purchased <laughs> And then that's what it uses to then, next time you go to Amazon.com, show you here are the most likely things you are interested in purchasing next based on your purchase history and based on thousands upon thousands of other individuals who've bought certain other things to you. Same thing kind of goes with stock trading and following trends, analyzing news articles. It'll look for certain keywords to see what companies are going to be higher or lower in the coming week. And then it, uh, a stock trading bot might tell your, you know, if you use it, your company will probably, uh, you probably have a company that you trust with a certain amount of money to trade stocks with. That company is going to be using algorithms rather than people in order to do it. And these algorithms are trained through machine learning. They are as today's definition and the way people use it, artificial intelligence rather than an algorithm these days. Uh, another thing uh, that you might notice, let's say you spend enough time chatting with the chat GPT bot, right? Uh, how many of you have actually spoken with chat GPT bot and, and played around with it uh, for maybe a considerable amount of time? Okay, so there, there are a couple of you. If you chat with it long enough, you might have noticed that any pre-established truth in your discussion is not something that ChatGPT bot uh, continues using moving forward with you. Let's say you said, are you an artificial intelligence? And it answers yes, one hour. The next hour it might say no. And it might say that it's a human named Darla or something along those lines. Um, the reason for that is, as you chat with ChatGPT bot, it takes your responses and it uses those as a part of a data set to train itself to respond to other people who are asking or speaking the same things to the ChatGPT bot. And that's where you might start to notice certain things kind of slip through the cracks. Uh, ChatGPT bot also might use uh, articles or, um, or writing things of that nature as part of its data set. So if you might ask it to, say, create a poem, that poem might technically be plagiarized from another location on the internet and, and used by ChatGPT bot. Maybe with some minor tweaks here and there, uh, based on whatever conditional you feed uh, ChatGPT bot, such as keep it to two sentences, or uh, use 20 different vowels in a single word, <laughs> which is, Always hilarious if you use the chat um, or the, uh, the voice to text feature along with it. But. Can we ask questions as we go along? Or do you want to wait 
if we if we could wait till after, that'd be because I, I have a feeling some questions might be answered by a little further slides. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's say everybody knows about what's going on with Tesla. You all know about uh, the self-driving cars, and everyone has concerns over those and, and uh, things of that nature. What you might not know is your answers on, say, image captcha, like I've got up on the screen, when you log into certain websites, say your bank or your email, um, and they run you through this test, this is another way that they are collecting data sets in order to train artificial intelligence. So your answers for what is a bus uh, out of these photos are used uh, by Tesla uh, or Amazon or whoever else is creating self-driving vehicles to then tell the vehicle what objects on its cameras are where and what they are. You know, and that's, that can be useful. You know, uh, let's say uh, another example that I don't have up on the screen would be crosswalks because technically it's illegal to park on a crosswalk, but a lot of people do it anyway, myself included. But the car would try to avoid it. And so by going through those questions and telling it what is considered a, a crosswalk on those images, it tells it what boundaries are supposed to be formed when it's you know, trying to drive and it's stopping at a stoplight, say. Things of that nature. So it comes to question, if all these data sets are considered useful, why are creatives so upset? And that's, where it gets to a bit of a sticky legal situation these days. Um, since the data sets come, have to come from somewhere, you might ask where the image generating AI are getting these data sets. And a lot of them are coming from, you know, public websites such as say DeviantArt or Instagram or history books uh, of say medieval artwork and things of that nature. In image generating AI, takes all these photos, it identifies what are in them, uh, it has these tags that are defined by whoever forms these data sets, say like this is an 18th century piece of artwork, uh, or it, this is oil painting, this is acrylic, this is digital, things of that nature. Each of these photos have a definition for. And so when you ask an artificial intelligence to generate one of these images, it is technically plagiarized from 30, 40, 50, hundreds, sometimes thousands of images that it has taken together to try and create something that you asked it to create. Uh, one such image I asked one to create was George Washington riding a unicorn. Took a, took a very easy George Washington oil paint, uh, painting, stuck a horn on the, <laughs> on the horse, and that's, that's what it did. But you know, it had to take a, a unicorn in a similar position to the horse that he was riding on in the painting, and then that's how it formed it together. Um, and that's, that can be good. And most uh, humans, their creative process is in a very similar manner where you have seen these different pieces of artwork. You've been influenced by these different pieces of artwork, and then you created one of your own. Right, but it's, it is still influenced in a similar manner to how an artificial intelligence does it. But it gets a little murky because these artists haven't provided their permission for their artwork to be used in these data sets uh, and used in such a manner. And uh, in some cases for these image generating AI, it's a little more obvious uh, than others where these data sets have taken the source images that are used to form them. Uh, in terms of storytelling AI, same thing is exactly what happens to pieces of writing. Uh, mostly the writing that is used in these data sets happens to be anything that's in, uh, say, I'm blanking on the term, but uh, it's been long enough that it's no longer protected by copyright. Okay. They're, they're out in public domain. Thank you. Uh, but in other cases, it's taken from, say, fan fiction websites or different websites. In some cases, uh, people who do copywriting for various websites to create articles for them to host and, and gather more people to come aboard, a lot of those people end up having their writing uh, taken and used as examples to train these AI data sets, and that's less ideal. 
for a lot of these uh, a lot of these people who make their money off of that. Uh, voice synthesization, wow, voice synthesization AI uh, is made in a somewhat more complex way. I'm less of an audio engineer than I am a programmer, but inflection, uh, the way you know someone speaks, their mannerisms are used to then train the AI to try and create a more and more convincing uh, deep fake of what this person might say or how they might sound saying these words that are scripted out for the AI to read off. Um, and as we go on and these generations of AI are created and destroyed, uh, I, earlier, I used a schoolhouse example of, say, 20 with four of them. The real numbers are hundreds of thousands every hour that are created and destroyed and retested. Um, as it goes on, these things are going to become much, much more difficult to tell where all their data sets are coming from. And as we continue to feed on and interact with these artificial intelligences, they are just going to grow and they're going to become a lot more convincing. Uh, and that's part of what the current Writers Guild strike is partially about. Uh, in their writing being used to create these artificial intelligence, um, especially Hollywood uh, has just fed every script to these artificial intelligences as a way to try and negotiate lower paying prices for all the writers for these shows and movies uh, because well, why would we pay you more when we have this artificial intelligence we purchased and fed all your writing in order to create new writing and new mysteries or, or new movie scripts? Uh, the other part of it is not only are their writing being taken from them, uh, you know, they're slipping legal loopholes in that allows them to then just take it without their permission and feed it into these things. Uh, the Writers Guild of America is, is facing a very deep struggle with that right now. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it is difficult to improve as these generations go on exactly where these data sets are going to be coming from and what the sources are. And that's, that's where things get a little murky. But uh, I'd like us to end that part of it on a positive note in discussing right now we are on the most rough step of training these algorithms, these machine learning AI, uh, and using them. Right now, it's really difficult, but once we get past this step, uh, these AI are going to help a lot of people. You know, I know I'm speaking to, to the Heritage Village community, but let's face it, some of you probably shouldn't be driving anymore. And when it comes to these, uh, these automatic driving cars, I have a feeling it's going to enable a lot more people to continue to have a social life and be safe on the road especially in uh, elder communities, you know, that's just one way in how these are going to be helping. The other thing is, I have a feeling in, say, even as soon as another five years, if not 10 years, these artificial intelligences and, and how they are currently being used by especially young people right now are going to become the norm. And they are going to be treated as less of an invasion of uh, creatives and like they're going to be taking all the creatives jobs and instead artificial intelligence is going to be used to speed up the creative process and be used more as a tool uh, in the near future mm -hmm. in order to create more pieces of artwork more media more everything for you to ha uh, consume and and you know free up more of your time um, and then I've got my sources over here. So if anyone has questions at this point, uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer some. Uh, 